My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm our executive director of the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship, and I'm also a professor at Weatherhead. Um, and we are thrilled to welcome back to campus, at least virtually, um, Mark Armanente, um, joining us from New York today. Um, and, and we're thrilled to have Mark on our board, have our fellow board member, Joe Mondato, uh, past participant in our speaker series, and uh, great to have Mark in conversation today. Um, as, as we do with all of our sessions, we're thrilled to have our awesome students lead and moderate. And um, Cooper Reef, who is a mechanical engineering major, minoring um, at Weatherhead, and was actually an a, a intern this summer and part of our remote entrepreneurship project uh, program and was interning with the spin out of the university. So Portfolio Photonics, which is a great um, startup company that was launched out of Ken Singer's technology. So Cooper was learning about the startup world and helping a case spin out, um, grow and, and succeed. So Cooper it was awesome having you in that program. And thank you for moderating today. For anybody that's watching on LinkedIn Live, if you have a question for Mark, just put it in the comments. Um, in the stream, and then Doug and I will be monitoring um, that, and we'll make sure we get it in. If you're here um, on Zoom, just let Cooper know when you have a question, and uh, we will get to you that way. So with that, welcome, Mark and Cooper, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome. If you're on Zoom or LinkedIn Live or maybe watching this recording after the fact, we are so glad to have you here today. Uh, my name is Cooper Reef. I am a third year at Case Western studying mechanical engineering with minors in both entrepreneurial studies and business management. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I would just like to make you aware of a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, if you have any questions, uh, there's multiple ways to ask them. You can either put them in the chat on Zoom or if you're on LinkedIn Live, put them in there and they'll get DM to me or even more encouraged and better for what we have going on here today, uh, feel free to just raise your hand in the participants section and I'll be able to call on you. And we can kind of make this more of an interactive event where uh, we can take it in whatever direction that the hour takes us. Um, in addition to that, I encourage you all to connect on LinkedIn. Events like these are a great way to connect with like-minded people and you really never know who you're going to come across and the kind of people that you're going to meet at these sorts of events. So if you would like to, you can put your LinkedIn profile, um, as I believe Professor Goldberg already has, into the chat. I will be sure to do mine at some point during the event. Um, and, and we can just chat after the event with, with other people that you meet. So I would like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Mr. Mark Armanante. Uh, he is a pioneer in the pharmaceutical systems industry, and he has far, far more accolades than I could possibly cram into an introduction. But just to highlight a few things, he is the founder and former chairman of the board of Viva Systems. He is the co-founder of Velocity, which if I uh, understand correctly, has just been finalized in acquisition by Salesforce. So congratulations to that. Correct. Yeah. It was, yes, yes. He is also a founder and CEO of Pharma Systems Incorporated. Uh, not to mention a 1974 graduate of Case Western studying biology and a member of our CWRU Board of Trustees. So we're incredibly lucky to have you on board with the university. And thank you so much for taking, uh, taking time out of your day today to, to share some of your wisdom and experiences with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's all Joe Mandato's uh, fault for bashing me over the head into submission to uh, join, the, uh, join the board over a 10 year period. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Yeah. <laughs> However long it takes. <laughs> well, just to kind of open it up with a little more broad of a question, I, I think one question that I, I had and I believe other people are having as well is how did Viva Systems come to be? Uh, what exactly is it as a company and what was the process of creating it and building it to such the industry titan it is today? Okay, well, what it is, is a uh, vertical SaaS software company that uh, targeted, targets uh, specifically pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, it's actually, if you look at the progression, I've been doing the same kind of systems for 35 years. Uh, 
uh, when I joined Oracle many, many moons ago, it was in 1986, I think it was, um, I was uh, given the pharmaceutical industry as my territory. I had, uh, was running a group of salespeople and we figured out pretty quickly that the way to sell solutions into an industry is to understand that industry thoroughly and to target and, and custom craft solutions for them. And so we did that at Oracle with great success. Um, then moving on to a company called Siebel Systems, I joined them as their head of sales when they formed in 1996. <laughs> and um, uh, our strategy there was we took 23 industries and built custom solutions for them. And that was all a client server architecture. Um, but when Siebel, uh, first we did an IPO, then we got sold to Oracle after that. And um, then it was time to do something completely new. And uh, we said, well, let's do it again. And we started Viva uh, as a new incarnation of what was then Siebel Systems. And Siebel had been acquired by Oracle. Entrepreneurial companies, when they get acquired, tend to hit the brakes. And uh, uh, Siebel was no longer servicing the industry. And we said, well, we can do a better job. And we formed Viva, was originally called Verticals on Demand, uh, because we were going to write uh, software for a bunch of different industries. Um, things were going, we started, let's do so, uh, pharma first because that was uh, the industry we knew best and pharma is a great marketplace. They're innovators, they, they got lots of money uh, and they're geographically compact, uh, mostly in the uh, Northeast, a little bit in Chicago, some biotech in the Bay Area, but it's easy to make sales calls on them. So we said, let's start there. And uh, Viva just took off. Uh, frankly, we didn't have time to do anything except pharma. Uh, we were going so deep into the, uh, the uh, vertical stack there uh, that um, we decided to focus in on that. And so we renamed ourselves uh, Viva Systems, uh, sounded more like a healthcare company. And um, we just focused in on, uh, on that one industry. <clears throat> Uh, about 10 years after Viva was formed, uh, um, I left uh, the chairmanship and the board. And uh, uh, because we had another idea, which was, what about all these other industries and um, that we never got around to doing? And so we formed Velocity, which was uh, the company that would succeed it and take and fulfill our vision. So that's why awesome. we did it. Uh, we did it with uh, kind of, gosh, people I've been in business with for 30 years. Uh, um, these are people I knew from Oracle. We went through Siebel together. We, you know, we, we've sold side by side and worked with one another for uh, a good long time. And we were just comfortable working together. We respected each other. Uh, you had to say something once and you knew it would get done. And uh, so my partners were Craig Ramsey, who was uh, my boss at Oracle, and uh, Young Soon, who's now my wife, but longtime business partner. And uh, the three of us, along with the CEO that we recruited, uh, Peter Gastner, um, uh, formed the company and grew it to you know, I don't follow the stock anymore. I think it's well over $4 billion market cap now. And they just had a, I think a $350 million quarter. So it was, uh, it's gotten big. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's definitely a great success story. And we're, we're so glad to, to hear it um, from beginning to end. Um, as far as earlier entrepreneurship that you had, most notably at Pharma Systems, how did that prepare you uh, for what we're going to do down the road, especially for, for people that are in college and thinking about maybe the near future and how that can better them for, for down the line? Well, you know, it starts earlier than that. I think my uh, first entrepreneurial job was uh, 
you know, mow, mowing lawns and uh, selling myself to my neighbors and my paper route. And, uh, and then later it was probably the worst job I ever had in my life. I was ran an ice cream truck and sold ice cream uh, to uh, kids in the summer. And uh, uh, those things teach you valuable lessons. Uh, think selling ice cream is easy? No. <laughs> Your clientele is uh, uh, not very sophisticated. <laughs> uh, you know, you're selling five and 10 cents uh, back then, uh, ice cream pops at a time. And those are the early seeds of entrepreneurialism. And, uh, uh, and then, yeah, pharmacists was my first really entrepreneurial thing. I'd gone through a big company called Burroughs um, where we sold computer systems and it felt boring. Uh, and a software company called IRI, which uh, I loved, uh, but uh, Pharma Systems was my first kind of quasi failure. My first, first entrepreneurial venture we didn't go to jail, we didn't go bankrupt, but we didn't make a lot of money. And I think if you look at the four years I did it, it was probably all done with, for minimum wage with the hours I worked and the return I got. Um, but, uh, you know, every failure of course teaches you a lot. Uh, in the ice cream truck, I learned you don't turn your back on young kids and the projects in Patterson because you get knifed for a, uh, in your butt for a, an ice cream cone. And uh, at Pharma Systems, I learned that uh, you got to watch your corporate structure because um, the seed of the company started in the UK and I kind of took a, a US, created the US company uh, as an independent company, but we cross guaranteed each other's loans, each other's uh, finances. And in the end, um, I ended up paying for their mistakes over in Europe and um, drained the company of all its resources. And we made a quick sale and no one made a lot of money, but boy, that's a great lesson. Uh, and uh, again, it was done with friends. It was done with my now wife. She was the CEO of uh, the company that succeeded it called Nomadic Systems. And um, great lessons. Um, one of the lessons learned there is keep up to date on your payroll taxes, because when the uh, IRS comes to your door, knocks on it and uh, says, uh, we're here to shut you down. Um, it's, uh, it's a life lesson. <laughs> They attach your mortgages, you know, they attach your bank accounts and uh, you don't make those mistakes again. So uh, gotta get thick skin too. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think failure is a big part of entrepreneurship. If you, if you haven't failed, uh, um, then you're probably not gonna find success uh, yeah. in there. So no it looks like we got a question in the chat actually from Mr. Joe Mandata, if you'd like to ask it yourself uh, and unmute, that would be that'd be great. Mark, uh, given given where you're from, given your background, uh, are you going to hold Jersey against me? Pardon me. Are you holding New Jersey against me, Joe? <laughs> no, but you pursued a non-traditional career, right? And and for uh, coming from a Midwestern school, uh, you took on significant risk. You moved west. Again, a non-traditional route. Your your uh, education was technical, um, it, it, and you were a sales guy. Yeah, that's really uh, I think it's one of the most valuable uh, uh, positions people can take. But it's just not people don't do that as a rule, right? Correct. I, I mean, so so there was more than just a. a a small amount of entrepreneurial spirit. What what caused you to take all these little risks? Um, <clears throat> so I come from a long line of chemists. My dad was a MIT chemist. My grandfather was a PhD from the University of Rome. Uh, mm. And so <clears throat> I was expected to come in and go into my dad's chemical and textile company. 
-hmm. which was at that point in time in the late 60s, early 70s, an industry that was dying. Uh, but nevertheless, it was kind of expected the oldest son to go take it over and uh, just didn't feel right to me. And uh, my inspiration came actually, I was uh, in biology um, and we had this one fascinating lab where we had to model the Krebs citric acid cycle or something of, uh, of an amphibian and uh, our uh, professor challenged us to do it on a computer, uh, an old uh, Univac back in the days, uh, punched cards. And I wrote this simple, simple, simple program, submitted the deck and spit back the answers. And I was just captivated. I just said, my gosh, this is, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And uh, <clears throat> I fell in love with computers and there was no such thing as software back then, but uh, <clears throat> because we were basically just issuing machine learning instructions back then, machine instructions. So uh, I fell in love with computers. And uh, so I had a long discussion with my dad about uh, how I was gonna go and you know go initially sell computers. I wasn't an electrical engineer. I wasn't allowed to program them. so. I went and got a job with this company called Burroughs, long gone now, but they sold computers and uh, sales job was the only one I could get. And uh, they hired me and I was successful and uh, made some money and uh, uh, did well and loved it. Uh, I loved the freedom of kind of being your own businessman. Uh, um, <clears throat> but good kind of going back, my, my dad and my grandfather were both entrepreneurs. They, uh, they owned, again, textile and chemical companies. And uh, I remember as a kid, uh, <clears throat> some years were great. Sales were good. We got nice Christmas gifts, took a trip to York, to the old country to see some relatives. Uh, and then the next year, it was just awful. I mean, there was no money at all. So. I got a lesson in running your own business from then, which was, you know, there are good times, there are bad times. Uh, sometimes there are external factors that uh, they're at work, but uh, to get through it all, you just had to work extremely hard all the time and remain focused. And uh, I've lost track of your question, Joe. I don't know if I answered it or not, but... <laughs> The second part of it is, is sales is definitely a non-traditional uh, career path for uh, technical graduates, um, uh, but just in general, right? Yeah. It's not, I, people don't wake up and say, I, I want to be a salesman more than anything else in the world after I graduate with a master's degree in engineering, right? Yeah. So, but it's one of the best experiences a business person can have. What do you, how would you comment? You know, everyone sells, <clears throat> no matter what you're doing. If you're a physician, you're selling the prognosis to your patient. If you're a CFO, you're selling the latest financial results or you want to use a new external consulting firm. Uh, no matter what you're doing, you're selling your ideas. <clears throat> and uh, so I think it's the most valuable thing anyone can, in business can have. <clears throat> I kind of stumbled into it because it was my only way into computers at the time, because I didn't have the technical background to do it. And it was a way to get close. Uh, but I remember with going around New England with my dad, going from textile mill to textile mill, trying to sell them the latest chemicals for, uh, and you know, it was, there was something fun about it, making the sale, losing some sales. It was exciting. And, uh, Actually, in my first computer job working for Burroughs, it was a big corporation. And even though it was still exciting selling, working for a company that big, it felt boring. And uh, so I knew I liked sales. Working for a big company taught me I, I wanted to work for something small, something that I could mold and create. Um, and... Um, something where you're kind of on the seat of your pants 
24 hours a day. And it keeps you alive, keeps you interested, keeps you in your game. And uh, it's terrifying, but boy, when you win, it's fun. When you lose, it's, you know, you feel like jumping off a bridge sometimes, but if you per persevere and win, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And sales is like that. It's a, you're constantly winning. You're constantly, the CEO of uh, Siebel Systems, uh, uh, she came up to me once and uh, she said, boy, Mark, because uh, I, was, I was running the sales organization. And she said, you know, your job, I understand it's interesting, it's fun, it's exciting, but there's nothing cumulative about your job. Every quarter, you're back being a bum because the clock gets reset to zero. And you got to prove yourself all over again. And uh, so uh, it's hard work, but I think it's just really gratifying. And I've seen so many people who are brilliant, who can study something to death, death but don't know how to sell their ideas. And, uh, and those ideas either get lost, or if they're lucky, they find someone who can sell those ideas for them. But if you can learn some sales skills, it's going to take you a lot further, I think, in, uh, in business than almost any other skill. Awesome. Yeah, this is, this is some great insight. So for all of the, the crew students listening on here, it might be a, a good tip to, to take a sales class with one of your electives if you can. Yeah. Um, so furthermore, um, to my understanding, you've had some earlier roles, some great roles at both Oracle and Information Resources. So I was just hoping to get a better understanding of what were you doing at these companies and what did you learn from those experiences that helped develop you for uh, later in your career? Cool. Um, information Resources was a company uh, I joined that was called Management Decision Systems at the time. And they had uh, a relational database called Express. It was a brilliant piece of software. There were three MIT guys got together and built the software and actually didn't know what to do with it. It was a brilliant piece of software. Um, when I was coming out of Burroughs, uh, there was this new thing called software and they, I interviewed there, they hired me and uh, it was an example of, I had a guy there, Dave Rosenblatt, he was my sales manager and um, he was a true mentor. He, uh, he showed me the ropes, he was tough, but kind, um, very intelligent, uh, and really honed my sales skills. And not so much sales skills, but it really helped me understand how you had to know your customer intrinsically. You had to, everything you did and say, and every piece of information you presented had to be couched in the terms and in the and in the way that your customer would understand it. And Dave taught me that. <clears throat> and I did very well there. I eventually became a executive vice president of sales and marketing. Um, and uh, we were acquired by information resources, which were, they essentially invented scanner data, supermarket scanner data. It was a perfect combination with our software. And we could analyze pricing information, effectiveness of marketing campaigns, couponing, everything had to do with both uh, retail and consumer packaged goods companies. Uh, so again, I was focused in on basically one industry there. Did very well, but that company was getting kind of big and hard to deal with. And I got a job offer from a company called Oracle. They were still small company back then in 1986. And, uh, you know, here I was an executive vice president. I had, you know, a couple hundred people working for me and they offered me a job as a director uh, and to start a new group at Oracle. And uh, so again, I had to go home, explain to my mom and dad that I wasn't an executive vice president anymore. I was a director and <laughs> uh, working for this company that no one ever heard from. Um, which is kind of another lesson I, I've learned along the way. Don't get stuck with titles mm -hmm. uh, and positions. I've seen so many people who turned down a great opportunity 
in a great new industry because they can't maintain their title or their the prestige that they thought they had. And it's a grave mistake. Uh, you move forward, things change, industries change, move out of the old, move into the new, reestablish yourself. And that was what Oracle did for me. It was uh, a new industry, uh, a new company, and it grew from, I think it was 200 people when I was there to, I, I don't know how big they are now, but uh, so again, I, I did well there. I got promoted. We did uh, a lot of deals. We sold sp to specific industries, uh, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, consumer packaged goods, all the process industries, and we customized solutions for them. And uh, um, Oracle was a sales machine. Uh, a lot of pressure, uh, but you learn from the best salespeople on the planet. And uh, um, again, these are the people that I went on to do Velocity and Siebel and uh, uh, Viva with. And uh, they're still all my best friends today because kind of went through the went through the mill, went through the grinder and uh, uh, learned a lot. So. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and I guess um, moving on from that, going back a little bit forward in time to, to Viva, uh, what, what was the big challenge in setting up that system? What do you think was the, if you had one goal to achieve and one mountain to, to climb, uh, what was that and what was the approach to, to conquering it? In the startup, it's, uh, you, you've got a software startup, you have to have a great, great product. There's no doubt about that. Uh, uh, but then it's revenue. Revenue cures all ills in a startup. And uh, you have to go out and uh, establish yourself early. And once you have a, a, you know, a decent product, once you can, one you can get out and not be ashamed of, <laughs> uh, once you get your first couple sales, um, then customer service kicks in. Your customers have to be insanely happy. And if you can do those three things in that order, uh, your chances of success are, are huge. Um, and we did that. Uh, the, those were lessons we had learned before, but we knew we had to have a great development staff. Uh, we knew what we were building already because we had built it at Oracle. We had built it at Siebel Systems. We were just building it in a new on a new platform, software as a service, cloud computing. Uh, Oracle was uh, uh, mainframe computers and DEC mini computers. Uh, Siebel Systems was client server architecture. Uh, and Viva was cloud. Same application, uh, basically the same product, uh, architected entirely differently. But we knew what we were building from, from the beginning. We knew who the customers were. We had sold to them all before. I remember the first sales call we won at, at Viva was the four founders. We went out to J&J &J and we walked in and the uh, CIO there, uh, Jean, I remember her name. She, she looked at us and she said, weren't you here six months ago with a different company? And we said, yeah, but this is a really good product. <laughs> she said, well, the last one was pretty good too. And you know, I don't think we're gonna be getting rid of it anytime soon. But we said, just wait, give us a little time. And I think it took us four years to close her, but eventually we replaced all our old systems at, uh, at all the J&J &J companies. And uh, uh, so those are the real, I think, keys to the success. Um, at Viva, we were incredibly capital efficient. Um, the uh, three of the four founders, we put in 100% of the capital and which was $4 million. And uh, we then took a venture round of another 4 million and, um, but never touched it. Uh, we never touched, so it was a total capitalization of 8 million. And uh, so it was very capital efficient. And our CEO, I, I credit him. He said, uh, I can't help it, I'm Swiss. We don't know how to lose money. So he, he ran a tight ship. 
Um, if we had a, uh, uh, the only headbutting were the three, three members of the board, Craig uh, Young and myself were the three salespeople. Uh, Peter was technical. He was very conservative in terms of expansion. We were very aggressive and it was a great tension. So we pushed him, he held us back. Uh, somehow we hit exactly the right balance and grew in a way that uh, uh, our burn rate was never negative. Um, uh, so we were very lucky. Or rather, of course it was negative up front, but uh, I think at the eight month mark, we were cash positive, which is shocking. So those are kind of the lessons learned there. I, I think another real lesson I've learned in a lot of, uh, a lot of these uh, early stage companies is, um, I've heard it expressed in a couple of different ways. Uh, back at the IRI MDS days, uh, I worked for a guy called Len Lodish, who was a marketing professor at Wharton. And he said that uh, his philosophy was for anything in marketing or sales or kind of any business decisions was ready, shoot, aim. So, and another one of my bosses, Tom Siebel at Siebel Systems said, it's a core strategy in this company that we're gonna have a bias for action. So they both said the same things, you know, kind of study something, look at it, assess it, but take an action do something first, you know, you, you need to be a first mover, you need to do something and you can fine tune it later. I've seen a lot of people who study something to death, they never put their plans into action and they kind of get forgotten because everyone's passing them by. Uh, you need a bias for action, you need to uh, make a move, calibrate, recalibrate and then move on. So uh, valuable lesson. Awesome, awesome. Uh, if, at this point, if anyone has any questions, feel, uh, feel free to speak up if you're on the Zoom. If you are on LinkedIn Live, feel free to type it into the chat and we will get that sent over. Um, but if no one has any questions right now, feel free to keep, oh, Mr. John Dada, please feel free. Mark, you, you described the dynamic uh, of your founder organization, but that it doesn't always work that way, right? So, so you know, when does self awareness kick in? Um, how do you deal with a less orderly dynamic amongst the fo uh, founder team? And when do you decide, or if do you decide, gee, I think we ought to hire a CEO that's not one of us? Yeah, it's, uh, tell you the truth, Joe, I've been left to led a charmed life you know, mm -hmm. with a lot of these things. Uh, with Viva, Young and Craig and I were smart enough to know that we weren't going to be the CEO of this thing. There were when we were getting on and in years and uh, we had, we need, we knew we needed someone younger. And uh, so, we were smart enough to hire an extremely smart, super motivated CEO. Um, but like I've invested in other companies and uh, I've seen companies where the founding CEO doesn't belong in the job. And uh, yeah, that self-awareness is, it's, it's hard. You know, you start something, you own it, you've, bled over this and you want to control it. But at some point uh, you realize that, uh, you know, if you notice in my career, I went from head of sales. Yeah, I was president of pharma systems, probably not the best role for me, head of sales. And then I kind of skipped over CEO and went to founder and chairman. And why? I'm just not a good administrator. You know, I know how to sell. I know how to, to roughly build the company and motivate people and uh, get things done. But uh, I remember I was 
once on the audit committee of Viva Systems. I didn't belong there. It was just my eyes glazed over. I had no interest. Uh, sometimes you're not cut out for a role. And, uh, you know, I think I knew I didn't belong as a CEO. Uh, I was a good head of sales and I was a good founder, but uh, not a great CEO. Uh, as a chairman to kind of steer the company, give some ideas, uh, absolutely. But uh, yeah, you have to be aware, you have to set your pride aside. And I've seen companies where they can't and uh, companies either fail or, you know, the investors get involved and you're thrown out of the position. Uh, it's not pretty. It goes back to that, uh, those people who like will hold on to a title and not move to a new, more interesting industry because they'll take a demotion. Um, that's a form of pride and holding on to something that uh, you shouldn't hold on to. And uh, same same case. And you know, the uh, solution is you got to put your pride aside, look at things rationally, and and uh, do the right thing. Awesome. I think there's a great lesson about knowing your strengths and acting yeah. with that in mind there. Um, looks like we got a question in the chat from William Whitmore. If you wanted to ask it yourself, uh, feel free to unmute and do so. If not, the question is just um, biggest failure in the lesson you took away from that. If you wanted to speak on to that. Uh, again, I think it was pharma systems was uh, I mean, if you look at it, uh, we all walked away with a little bit of money, uh, but was it a failure? Absolutely. A um, lot of lessons, again, corporate structure, uh, your business, I learned corporate structure is important. I learned uh, knowing and uh, working with good business partners is important. Uh, and again, my role there as uh, the CEO was probably not the best role for me. And um, so all valuable lessons and all stems from failures. And, um, you know, if that kid hadn't stabbed me in the butt on the ice cream truck, who knows, I might be st still be selling ice cream. So failures are good. Yeah, yeah, you never know what will, what will happen and, and turn your direction. <laughs> So it looks like we have a question from Professor Goldberg himself. So if you wanted to ask that. Great, no thanks, Cooper. Uh, this is such a great conversation. Thanks, Mark, um, for joining us today. So let's fast forward to our current world in existence and doing things over Zoom and um, you know travel sort of heavily restricted. And I'm sort of curious from your perspective, the learnings kind of during this time, I mean, folks are doing business very differently now selling looks very different because of, of challenges around travel. I'm sort of curious your reflections on kind of the current state of doing business and what, when we're able to get back together again, what kind of lessons might we take from this period, do you think going forward? You know, I'm reluctant to give uh, too much advice. I feel like a dinosaur th these days. Uh, and my reaction would be, it's better to sell face to face. But I've been surprised at how effective Zoom can be. It's a good substitute. Um, uh, I still think walking to someone's office, um, looking around an office or their desk and seeing what's there, you see a, a picture of someone's kids and uh, maybe someone's square dancing or mountain climbing and uh, you develop a rapport and an insight to them that you just can't get over uh, Zoom. Um, you also don't pick up all the nuances of the body language and the reaction and uh, uh, there's also a corporate culture uh, going to uh, different corporations where you don't pick up over Zoom. Uh, 
walk into a corporate headquarters, you get a feeling instantly for what kind of organization is this and how do I customize my product or services for them. And um, so I don't think it's ever going away. And I think, um, um, all right, here's a anecdote, but uh, I don't know how useful it is, but about six years ago, I had this friend who's one of these guys who jumps from job to job just looking for a title. He is VP of this, senior VP of that, uh, with no experience. He just found these jobs where he could have a great title. And he finally got this job working for a uh, quasi-pharmaceutical company. And he said, look, would you come meet with me and the CEO of this company and give us some insights and uh, so we we're sitting there at lunch and he asked me, he said, so how would you go about making, you know, sales calls, increasing sales? Because he was in a sales role. And I says, well, you got to go out. You got to basically get on the phone, call people. You're not going to know who they are, but, and uh, you got to write letters. You got to do this, do that, boom, whole list of kind of these traditional sales tactics. And he said, Oh, no, 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 Mark. No, no, you don't understand. I just make introductions through LinkedIn and I get sales leads that way. And, um, you know, I said, well, maybe so, but, uh, you know, I think it's harder than that, that everyone's doing that. It's easy to do. You have to differentiate yourself. And, you know, he lasted six months and became a VP somewhere else. And that company's bankrupt now, but you got to put in the hard work. It's not easy. You know, you got to, uh, and I think the hard work is getting on an airplane and visit your customer and sit across from them and get to know them and uh, understand what they, because the customer will tell you what they want, but it's rarely what they want. They tell you what they think they want and uh, you have to go and understand what they, number one, what they really need and not only what they want, but what's the person who's making the decision, you know, his or her boss, what do they want too? Because that's who's buying. And uh, over a Zoom conversation, you don't pick up those nuances. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely an interesting transition going on in the business world today. My dad and I were just talking about this last night, just who knows what will remain from, from the, the COVID-19 world of business uh, after the pandemic is over, what, what's here to stay and what would revert back to normal. It's definitely an interesting conversation. Um, we've got about five minutes left before I hand it back over to Professor Goldberg. One question I'd like to ask is, what's one thing you wish you knew or wish you looked into more um, at your time at Case Western before you moved on with your career? So one thing you, you wish you really had a good, better grasp of or paid more attention to or, or whatnot? Um, I wish I'd had, uh, oh boy. I was lucky from one perspective. I, uh, even though I was studying science, I took the time I took uh, literature courses. I took uh, my th three favorite courses at, uh, at Case were taught by David Orenstein. And he taught me comedies, tragedies, and histories, Shakespeare. And they were the three best courses I had at the university. They were fascinating. And what I learned from him was he had the most passion for a subject. Um, so that was, uh, that was a real, uh, that was a real lesson. I wish I had done that a little bit more, um, uh, kind of stepped outside of the bounds and taken a few more of those courses. Um, cause not only do they, are they interesting, but they prepare you for the wider world. Again, if you're selling and you're in someone's, uh, uh, office and, there's a copy of Shakespeare on his desk, and you know I, I think I could still recite Henry the Act, Henry the, the Third Act Three, Scene One, um, from memory, and uh, you know it builds a builds a bond with someone. So the more you learn outside of your strict discipline, 
the more liberal arts education you have, the more uh, the more facile you are in the in the world around you. And um, so I wish I had kind of gotten out some more. I was, uh, despite the fact that I'm a sales guy, I was pretty quiet and pretty reserved and uh, never missed a class. I don't think I was ever late for a class. Uh, you know, I didn't party too much. And I think those are valuable lessons. I, I got them later on. I kind of, I kind of blossomed after school, but uh, maybe fooling around a little bit more could have been a little more instructive for me. I didn't have a my first day till I was a junior in college. So how how bad is that? <laughs> uh, so maybe I should have uh, maybe I should have gotten out and done some more social things earlier. Yeah, I think bouncing off of that question a little bit, do you have a favorite memory uh, from your time at Case West and whether that was something that ended up serving you down your career path or something that was completely unrelated? Um, just looking back at your time there. Uh, I do. It was, um, I went with a friend of mine, uh, Richie Gampert, he just died. He was a case, uh, case graduate, of course. And the first guy I knew to come out of the closet and this was 1972, 1971, super early. And uh, he was always trying to recruit me to his camp and never did, but he took me to this gay club in downtown uh, Cleveland. And um, uh, the, uh, oh gosh, what was the name of the group? Uh, oh. They sang, uh, their big song was Heroin. Uh, they, there's an album with uh, Andy Warhol did a banana on the, uh, it was just the front cover. We went there and we had a crazy night and it was a world I had never seen before. And it just left an indelible impression on me. And uh, Rich and I were friends for the rest of, uh, rest of his life. And uh, it was a good memory, I was just, one of those few times I broke out and it was in such a spectacular way <laughs> that uh, it was just crazy. So uh, a lot of fun, yeah. That was a great memory. And I think those classes from Dr. Ornstein's class were amazing. Uh, the passion, I said, there's a guy who loves what he does. And uh, I think that was a lesson and the other was, I remember was, uh, oh, my genetics professor, Dr. Lesh Laurie. And uh, she, uh, I remember we came into the big lecture hall and she said, all right, you know, there were 200 kids in, in the uh, audience. And she said, um, everyone introduce yourselves. And then the next day we come in and sit randomly and she knew everyone's name. And I just said, wow. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> uh, so uh, those three things I remember the most. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, lo lots of memories, definitely. I, I look forward to, to years from now looking back into my experiences uh, here at Case Western as well. Yeah. Um, but to wrap things up, thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, I'm sure everyone that was here and everyone that's going to be watching this in the future really appreciates this. Um, and you taking some time out of your day to, to share what you, all the experiences that you had and the great career that you've had. Um, and from here, I'd like to toss it on over to Professor Goldberg to, to wrap us up today. Cool. Great, Cooper, awesome job. Thanks for moderating. You can see Mark, uh, why, why the, the move to having student moderators was the, was the greatest single move I've made in my <laughs> Yale uh, Institute role. It's been, I mean, our students- Giving up that CEO role. Oh, exactly right.